This will be our 39th lesson in Genesis. We're breezing right along, so to speak. A lot of very wonderful things. Now, a text we're going to deal with tonight, this would be a, this is one of those texts, this is not like an easy text to teach, but I figure anything in the Bible needs to be taught. So I just got a few more tools to do some digging here. Because see, in the book of Genesis, it's the book of beginnings. Now I've tracked all the firsts. Up to now, we got, I got 270 firsts. Things that first happened in Genesis. Now, Genesis is acquainting us with God. The book of Genesis is not really about people. It's about God. He shows in there what a single encounter with God can do. Some of these people had one, two, three, even Abraham, just four or five direct encounters with God, but this has <laughs> altered his whole life, and he hardly was told anything. He wasn't told anything about heaven, anything about what was coming, anything about after death. He wasn't told anything about that. All of the promises he had had to do with life here. There was a hint that through his seed all nations of the world or all families of the earth would be blessed. It was like a hint, but that's, that's, a, that's the extent of it. See, sin had done such a number on the human race that God couldn't talk with it. He had to just kind of hint around, say a few things here, a few things there. Was The human race had to go to school Amen. to learn about God, what he's like. And up to the flood, that's about 1,650-some years, about the only thing he knew about God is he had wrath towards sin. That's about it. The only indication of a, any kind of a benefit wasn't even told Adam and Eve. The gospel was preached as the devil and the whole human race was present. <laughs> yeah. He said he's going to, going to bruise the head of the serpent and the serpent's going to bruise his heel. That's it. Not a, sing, not a syllable. Yeah. Not a syllable was uttered about it. No one knew nothing at all about a redeemer wasn't revealed. But God is building up people he can talk with, communicate with. That's in that's in Genesis. Before, when you get to Exodus, he's got a whole nation of people he can talk to. Well, they were stubborn people. I understand that. They were stubborn people. But God's looking ahead. Before he sent his son into the world, there had to be a climate in which his son could be reared. Maybe no one else took advantage of this climate, but his son would. His son could never have been born in Rome or Alexandria. Never. Because they were godless cultures. So the reason for Israel and the reason for Canaan was he isolated these people. Every day they read from the every day they read from the law of Moses and the prophets. Every every Sabbath day they read it. They made, they were stiff necked and hard hearted, but they they didn't come up short about knowing quote what the Bible said. Amen. Why <laughs> they didn't compare it all with the average church member today? Now see what that was all about was Jesus had to come up to speed by the time he's twelve. He had to know what was going on. And he grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. So he had to come up to speed. And so that's what this was all about, was creating an, an environment in which his son could grow up Amen. and profit. You've got to keep that in mind when you read all the things in Genesis that's happening. You have to keep that in mind. Now tonight we're going <laughs> to... The generations of Ishmael and Isaac... Now you may think we might not get anything out of that, but wait, wait and see. So this is Genesis 25. Can I, can I say something? Sure. You know, they wonder what age a child should be 
obedient to the Lord. Well, up until about 12 years old, and Jesus said, don't you know, it must be about my father's business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he already, yeah, I don't know why, when that, that didn't just come to him then, that he knew that by then, that's right. So they ought to be a, a child, I see, I, I believe this, and, we, and we, I teach with this in mind, a child should be conversant with the things of God by the time they're 12. He should be able to hold an intelligent conversation with the doctors of the law by the time they're 12. There's your standard. You're right. There's a standard. Lord Jesus. Amen. Actually, quite edifying. Yeah. Samuel, you know, he wore the ephod when he was just, just a child. And Saul of Tarsus, his parents had him raised by the premier Jewish doctrine of the law. He was raised up at the feet of Gamaliel, the premier... He would be the like the premier college professor. He had this little boy. Huh? That's how, I, that's how people of God were tra trained. All right, this, this is Genesis 25, verse 12. Now these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, bare unto Abraham. Know how God, very particular there, spells out... <laughs> And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names, according to their generations. The firstborn of Ishmael was Nebajoth, and Kedar, and Adbiel, and Midsem, and Mishma, and Duma, and Massa, Hadar, and Tema, Jetur, Nephesh, and Kedima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their towns, by their castles, twelve princes according to their nations. <laughs> And these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 130 and 7 years, and he gave up the ghost and died and was gathered unto his people. They dwelt from Havilah, that is the in, offspring of Ishmael, dwelt from Havilah to Shur, that is before Egypt, as thou goest down to Assyria. And he died in the presence of all his brethren. And these are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to the wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, and of Padanaram, and the sister to Laban, the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord was entreated of him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels, and the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red all over like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel, and his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew. And Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison, but Rebekah loved Jacob. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field. I'm going to stop there. I just wanted to go to verse 27. The boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter and a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. That's, that's the extent of our text tonight. Ishmael and Isaac. These are the generations of Ishmael. And Isaac. Both had the same progenitor, Abraham. But that's where the likeness ends. One obtained the inheritance, one did not. One was born of the flesh, one is born of the spirit. One was favored, one was not favored. One was accepted, another was not accepted. One was allowed to grow up into adulthood in Abraham's house, the other was not. Both had extensive progeny, 
but the progeny of Ishmael was divided and the ones of Jacob were united. According to the flesh, one was first, but according to the spirit, the other was first. Both of them moved about from place to place. But Ishmael's descendants were nomads, and Isaac's journey is in a strange land and journeyed as pilgrims and strangers in the land they were going to inherit. The mother of one was blessed, the mother of another one wasn't. One was in the messianic lineage and one wasn't. Now whatever you may think about it, all men are not alike. I mean, we really shouldn't have to have a course on this. There are 75 men mentioned from Adam to Christ. Most of the, the lineage. Most of them, you don't know a thing in the world about them. We said, now what do you know about good old Peleg? <laughs> you don't know squat about them. But these men, every one of these men were hand-picked. You can't account for it any other way. Now we trace the genealogies. Adam for eight, says he had 130, he gave said boy fifth, and then for the next 800 years he begat many sons and daughters. And that same thing is said of all those, for hundreds and hundreds of years they begat many, many sons and daughters, but only one of them. <laughs> so God's teaches he's a, like he's a choosing God. If you don't like a choosing God, then you got to get off the boat. God's a choosing God, and he doesn't tell you always why he did. We don't know why he chose all those. But that's what he did. Seth, that's our, all the sons and daughters. Adam had Seth. He, he was the one raised up to take the place of Abel. So that's what Eve said. And Enos, you don't know much about Enos. That's his son. He's in the lineage. So what God's teaching you. This would get on to Abraham is the same thing. God just beaten down and just picked out Abraham. Abraham wasn't seeking God. Abraham didn't have a godly background. He had an idolatrous background. But God, uh, well, God's teaching us that this is the way he is. You've, at some point, you'll arrive at the point where you know you've got to let God make the choice. God can back in the corner, so this is your... your You'd be like David. He said, I'm, God said, I'll give you three choices. Since you counted up how many people you had, I'm going to give you three choices to get out of this. David said, I'm going to let you make the choice. Because <laughs> there's mercy with you. Yeah, at some point now, maybe like having to endure something like Brother Matthew and Sister Nicole endured. But at some point, you got to let go of your life and, and turn the thing over to God and say, Thy will be done. At some point, mm -hmm. every discerning person comes to that point. Yeah. where And he's he teaching you about this all the way. It should make perfect sense to do this. Now in the uh, book of Genesis, the focus is on Abraham's progeny. From chapter 12, 1, to Revelation 22, 22, it's about Abraham and his seed. The rest of the Bible, that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. When he mentions something, the only reason he mentions outsiders is they, they, their paths crossed with his people. That's it. Yeah. And of course, Jesus is the ultimate yeah. Amen. seed. Up until all through Genesis, there, there, well, up until 11, through 11, there was very little emphasis on an individual. In creation, the emphasis was on Adam. That is true. In the, in the fall, the emphasis was on Adam. In the flood, the emphasis was on Noah, and that's, that's about, that's all you got to work with. Mm -hmm. History doesn't mean as much to God as it does to men. God only skips on the mountains of history. He doesn't, he doesn't go down in all these things that intrigue men. He just goes across the top where his purpose is being executed. He may, he may pass over a millennium, just... Just pass over it and not make any observation at all about it. What he did, it's what he's doing here in Genesis. See, the, the thing that's important to us must be the thing that's important to God. That's the way it's got to be now. And if you 
I hope no one has trouble with that, but if you do, you, you got to acclimate to this. Because God is the one that sets up the priorities. And when it comes to, like, history, he, he decided how you thought about it. Throughout these chapters, there's mentions made of several generations. Some people are generations are mentioned. Adam, Noah, sons of Noah, Shem, and Terah. They didn't have any other genera up, up to this text here. Commencing with the 12th chapter of Genesis, the emphasis is placed on Abraham. We read of the generations of Ishmael, Isaac, Jake, es Isaac Esau, and Jacob. And he, he restricts the generation he talks about. So preparing us for what he's going to do in the framework of time. See, time is like a framework in which God is working out a purpose that he determined before he made the world. He made the world with this purpose in mind. Right. And everything in nature in some way reflects it. You can, you can see it, what God's purposed. He has determined that he would work in a competing environment. He's going to work out his purpose in a, in a, a competing environment where hostile forces are aligned against each other. That's the environment in which he's going to work salvation out. So there are going to be two different kinds of people. He's starting to accent it now. <laughs> he's going to start to accent it now. It's a certain social framework in which the work of God is done. All of us, because a person in Christ is a generally he's a peacemaker. That, that's what is his heart. He doesn't like turmoil and agitation. But the truth of the matter is, that's the kind of environment you got to work out your salvation in a, in a war zone. It's how it's designed. See, God gets a lot of glory here by doing this. Two different kind of people. Well, you saw it right off, Cain and Abel, see, two different kind of people. There was no one in the rest of the world. It was Isaac and Ishmael, two different kind of people. Jacob and Esau, two different kind of people. There was Israel and the rest of the world, and the land of Canaan and the rest of the world. This is God's teaching, you see. <laughs> Wherever there's something good, there's something evil, too. Yeah, that's right. Devils are working. By design. It's designed this way. We're not going to float on bed's ease to glory. That's not the way this thing is designed to work. I know that there are people that teach differently. But see, we just, we just hope their, their mouths need to be stopped. This is the way it is. There's a contrast noted in humanity. There's righteous and unrighteous. There's righteous and wicked. Godly and ungodly, holy and unholy, sheep and goats, wheat and tares, children of the kingdom, children of the wicked one, wise and foolish, those that fear God, those that don't, light and darkness. Once you were dark, darkness, now you're light. See this, these, these two. Can you tell the difference? Have you, have, you, have you advanced enough in Christ that you can tell the difference between righteous and unrighteous? See, some people can't. But salvation, it'll equip you Amen. to discern good and evil. That's right. Persecuted him that was born after the spirit. That's right. And so it is now. Mm -hmm. See, men have to learn to think like this. Mm -hmm. When you get up in the morning, you got to put on your armor. Amen. You're going to face it somewhere. Amen. Some people face it before they get out of the house. Uh -huh. Man's foes are those of his own house, Jesus yeah. says. See, so those of us that uh, don't have that, we must be especially thankful. Yes. Everybody has not had this benefit. Mm -hmm. Where both of the spouses are in Christ and they have one spirit. See, everybody hasn't had this. Mm -hmm. So give a special thanks, praise to God for it. Now, these are the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son. Now, notice how precise he is. Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's handmaid, he spells out so, he, so you know who he's talking about. Now, by virtue of Hagar the Egyptian and the handmaid, by virtue of that, she couldn't stay in the house. 
and her son couldn't either. One of the few cases where the woman called the shots. Remember, Sarah said, cast out the bond woman and her son. And the scripture says, this is very grievous for Abraham. I'm, I'm sure he didn't say this, but I'm the boss, you know. I should be making the decisions. God said, hearken to the voice of your wife. She got it. You missed it. Get rid of them. They're not, I'm not going to work with them. Promises to Isaac. Isaac is the heir. So the record makes the pedigree of Ishmael clear. Hagar the Egyptian, yeah. handmade to save. So he makes a he makes it clear his pedigree wasn't from Abraham. Now, there's a parallel situation here that, of course, we must see. There's a sense in which all men, God is the Father of all flesh, and there is a sense in which that's true. He gives life and breath and all things to everybody. And all men are obligated to seek the Lord, as Acts 17, 26 tells us. But there is a privileged people, just as surely as Abraham was privileged. There are people whom God rejects, and he tells you who they are, the wicked. People God accepts, See, when it comes to partaking of the benefits of Christ, all men do not have equal rights. <laughs> I know the land of the free and all that. I, but see, that, uh, that actually has kind of muddied the water. All men have equal rights, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. Sounds really nice, but it's kind of got things skewed off in the wrong direction. That isn't the way God said it at all. Yeah. Said men have a right to seek me. Yeah, that's right. It's really when it gets right down to it, all they have the right to do. When it comes to partaking of the benefits of salvation, only those in fellowship with Christ can do it. You have to be connected with Christ. Amen. Now the scriptures tell us how to, mm -hmm. procedures to do this, but the connection is deeper than the procedures. You can go through the outward procedures, but if your heart's not in it, and nobody knows that but God. <laughs> See? So we can't go around saying, you weren't sincere, you weren't, we don't, we don't know. But God does. And only those who are motivated by faith and connected with Christ, through these very baptized into, baptized into Christ, not into water, into Christ, yeah. It happened when you went out in the water. But no man can put you in Christ. Amen. Settle that in your mind right now. It's of God that you're in Christ Jesus. He did it at that time. But those are the ones that God recognizes. <laughs> These are their names of Ishmael, sons. And I give you, we really don't know a lot about these sons, but I give you what... what what was available. I'm not going to go into it because it's, I don't care to at this time, but they largely were associated with the Arab nations. They're named by their towns and by their castles, towns and castles, what different versions say it <laughs> different ways, but what it boils down to, a town was like a settlement and a castle was like a fenced or walled, a protected area. So they, uh, they named their cities after themselves. <laughs> well, men still have a tendency to do this. I believe it was David who said that they call their lands after their names. There's all kind of Christian ministries that have the name of the guy who's running the ministry. I never felt comfortable with that. But it's quite common, the so-and-so Joe Doe ministry. That's, that's a, that's a uh, Ishmaelite custom. <laughs> so I tells you about there were 12 princes and God had promised Hagar that Ishmael would have 12 princes and God promised he'd bless Ishmael. God said, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. He, did, he didn't mean that he might be the seed. He meant give him a blessing. 
God said, I've heard you on, I've heard you on this matter. I'm going I'm to bless Isaac because he's your seed. He's going to have 12 princes, make a meditation of them. But he, he wasn't going to be Abraham's seed. Now the life of Ishmael, he lived to be 137 years old. We don't know a whole lot about Ishmael. I'll tell you what we do know about him. We know the circumstances under which he was born, where Sarah gave her handmaid to Abraham. We know his mother's name. We know he was circumcised when he was 13. We know he mocked Isaac. We know he was expelled from Abraham's home. We know he almost died in the wilderness, remember? So the angel showed him a well of water. We know God is with him as he grew up in the wilderness and he became an archer. He was a wild man prone to fight. But he was never intended to be Abraham's heir. God appointed him to be a father of a nation that beget 12 princes. We find that when Abraham died, he joined Abraham and burying he joined Isaac and burying Abraham. We know he did that. The generations are specified, his generations, and we know that Esau married one of his daughters in Genesis 28:9. That, that's it. So someone, after you'd lived 137 years, someone said, well, we can tell you, all we know is 12 things about, we'd say, oh boy, that, that's not very good. 120, 137 years, you only come up with 12 things? Or something. That'd make a short book. Huh? Well, you, we know more things about you by, by what happened to you yesterday than you know about Ishmael. Why? Well, I guess some people God just doesn't do a lot of commenting on. That's the way it is. When you're not aligned with God, I gotta be careful how I say this, but God doesn't have a lot of interest in you until you get interested in Him. Then that changes the whole, that changes the whole thing. Yes. This way be right to say it. If you're not in line with God, then you're not really worth being commented on. Would that be a right, a right way to say yeah, it? Yeah, that's the way it is. Because God operates according to His purpose. See, mm -hmm. what God His purpose drives everything He does. Right. Yes. Now here was a man blessed in the world because of another man. God said He'd bless Abraham. He blessed Ishmael. Because he was Abraham's seed. So he, what blessing he got, he got because of Abraham. Amen. That's right. So you learn to think of God like this. God can bless one person because of another person. Like he blessed those in Christ because of Christ. Yeah. He's, he's schooling you and how he, this is his manner. Wonderful thing to see. <clears throat> Yet even though these people were blessed, they were outside the covenant. Their inheritance was in the world. They were outside the covenant. Yes? Something that I was considering here was the union of a godly man of faith with a woman that is equated to be with the world. Hagar was said to be the Egyptian. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people in our generation, maybe not just in our generation, have thought that if you take something of the world and join it to yeah. Christ or to yeah. someone of faith, then that sanctifies the yeah. of the world. But th there's a small shadow that can be seen here that the results of joining the faith and the world here was unacceptable. That's right. The only acceptable seed was found whenever the holy, too yeah. holy, were mm -hmm. joined. Then it was accepted. It was a prophet, remember Haggai, I think it was, that... He said to a priest, if you have holy flesh in your garment and you touch something that's unholy, will that holy flesh make that unholy thing holy? He said, no, no, it won't do it. So if you have unclean flesh in your garment and you touch something that's holy, will that make the holy thing unholy? Yes. That's the way the kingdom of God works. Godliness does not rub off. Because people are around godly people, that doesn't make them godly. But godly people can become ungodly by being around ungodly people. 
And that's why Jude says, now them says, some you got to save with fear. That's not, he didn't mean scare them into heaven. He meant you are the one that should fear. That's right. Hating even the garments brought by the flesh. Or he said, if the brother be fallen, he says, ye that are spiritual, restore him. Consider in yourself, lest you also be tempted. Yeah. I tell you, bringing backsliders back, someone's got to do it. I understand this, but it's a dangerous work. You got to be stable to do that kind of work. Because what's unholy does rub off. Uh -huh. Evil communications corrupt good manners, but good manners do not make bad ones holy. <laughs> It's enough for us to know that Ishmael was not of God's people. He said he was gathered to his people. Now when Abraham died, he was gathered to his people. And we gave you some examples. Some people gathered to his people. Like when Lazarus died, he was gathered to his people. Abraham, Abraham's bosom, he's gathered to his people. Those that were beheaded for their, for their testimony, John saw them. They were gathered to their people under the altar. Remember that? They were gathered to their people. And, and Isaac, Ishmael's gathered to his people. So the people you make associations with here, keep preeminent associations with here, associations transfer to the after you die. Amen. Some people say, well, that's the grave talking about. I don't know that the grave is ever pictured as a gathering point. I think you've got to know, know the scriptures. If you know where it's, if you know where it says the grave's a gathering point, well, then you Got to speak up, but it's not. That's not where it is. For your body, it is. But now it says they dwelt from Havila unto Shur. That before Egypt, I give a little map there. Roughly speaking, this is what that area is called Saudi Arabia today. I don't. The boundaries are. It's not that clear to me how the boundaries all worked out. But it's that general area, Saudi Arabia. It's a desert area. That's where Ishmael's. After Ishmael's offspring was in a desert area. All right, now God talks about the land he's going to give Abraham seed. Listen to what he said. The Lord thy God bringeth thee into a good land, a land of brooks of water, fountains and depths and springs of the valleys and the hills. A little later. And it drinks water of the water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God cares for. See the difference between Canaan and Arabia? What was the difference? God blessed one land, didn't bless the other. In fact, the prophet Ezekiel said that God could cause it to rain on one city and not on another. And he could even cause it to rain on one field and the next one to it, it wouldn't rain on. Yeah. We've talked about them when he first moved here, there was a tornado warning. All the horns went off. Tornado warning in the sky was real green, you know. We looked out the window, and it was like we were in a, like a canopy here. It was perfect. The weather was perfect, about a, about a hundred feet around the house. It rained in and everything in places, but it wasn't there. Now, it, it's, that's the only time that ever happened to us, but confirm that this is true. Now, this is good news if you're thinking about the condition of society and the possibility of wars and rumors of wars. See, it all of a sudden you say, oh, listen, God can, God can protect you. He can put a stone out there for a covert, a man for a covert. Hide you from the tempest. You don't have to. You're going to worry. Find something better to worry about than that. Amen. Their dwelling place, that's where they dwelt. Dry and thirsty land where no water was. Now, the land allotted to Ishmael was close to Canaan. It was just a little southeast. It was just right, right near the border there. <laughs> but it wasn't near enough. <laughs> they couldn't partake of the plentifulness that the Canaan did, even though they were really... Can't you see it, people? There are some people that are not far from the kingdom of God. They're right, but they're not in it. They're not partaking of it. They got some good qualities, but they're not in it. See? In the New Covenant, there's two kinds of people that are excluded from it. One's the Old Covenant. People living by the Old Covenant, they're excluded. And the Gentile world, it was excluded. Even though some of them were pretty, pretty close. 
Perhaps you know somebody that uh, they're pretty near a Christian, but they aren't. So none of the no person can be made qualified to be received by God by just getting close to someone else that's close to God. That won't sanctify. The only person that can sanctify you is Christ. You've got to get into Christ and then be sanctified by Him. Amen. So the uh, idea of dumbing down the gospel so you can make it attractive to people or getting close to people so you can win them. And we're not going to condemn anybody for this. We're just going to say this is not something God said. This is not how God works. This isn't how you do it. You don't win people with friendship. You don't win people with friendship. You've got to be dogmatic about this. The power of God's in the gospel. The gospel of Christ is, is, not a power, the power of God to salvation. So until the gospel is delivered, salvation isn't even within reach. Yeah, yes. Jesus died, he was buried, he was resurrected, he sent him in. That's right. And the epistles then expounded those. Right. They took that and they flowered it out that this death, burial, and resurrection had a glorious effect. Yes, amen. But you've got to participate in all three of them, okay. right? Yeah. yeah. I remember years ago that somebody was talking about the church down the road <clears throat> getting them in with hot dogs. And um, somebody spoke up and said, well, I hope they have a lot of them because whatever you win them with, you keep them with. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, it states that Ishmael died in the presence of his brethren. Now, I've, I've mentioned this thing about other versions quite a bit, but I work with this every day, seven days a week. Every week, I compare these various versions but now here's, here's what the text says. He died in the presence of his brethren. New American Standard Bible says he settled in defiance of all his relatives. NIV says they lived in hostility toward their relatives. The New Revised Standard says they settled down alongside all his people. The American Standard Version said he abode over against all his people, brethren. Basic Bible English said they took their place to the east of all their brothers. Darby's version said he settled before the face of all his brethren. English Revised says he abode in the presence of all his brethren. Geneva Bible says Ishmael dwelt in the presence of all his brethren. God's Word Bible says they all fought each other. New American Bible says each of them pitched camp in opposition to the various brethren, their kinsmen. Net Bible says they settled away from all their relatives. New Jerusalem Bible says he held his own against all the kinsmen. Young's literal translation says, In the presence of all his brethren hath he fallen. Living Bible says they were constantly at war with one another. English Standard Version says they often attacked their brother's people. Good News Bible says they lived apart from the other descendants of Abraham. Message Bible says the Ishmaelites didn't get along with any of their kin. Amplified Bible says Ishmael dwelt close to the lands of all his brethren. The Interlinear Bible says that on, on faces of all of him he fell. That's 19 different, 19 different representations. Now, I dedicate this to those who venerate the original language. If the key is the original language, how come we got all these differences? I'll tell you why. Because the original, the manuscripts don't agree, the lexicons don't agree, the scholars don't agree. If you want to understand the Bible now, you're going to have to have another more reliable resource. Yeah, that's, right. that's just one example. We give an example of this every once in a while. <laughs> How remarkable it is. Like if you say, well, what does it mean? You know? Well, I take it to mean just exactly what it said. He died in the presence of his brethren. His offspring were there when he died. See, an inconsistent resource cannot be used as a basis for an interpretation or a ground for agreement. Surely everybody sees that. It has to be a consistent resource that's reliable from A to Z and doesn't vary. So it can't be like manuscripts. Begin with, we don't have a manuscript that's not at least 300 years old. 
I don't know how you can say that that was the we got the we got the original one there. Remember how God he, there's only one sample of divine handwriting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where God wrote on tables of stone. Now men want to put it in a museum. They put it in a Smithsonian. You can fly over there and see there. Look at that. There's what God wrote. But God hid it so nobody could see it. Yeah. Why? Because God says you got to have faith. Yes, the ground of your confidence has to be faith, mm -hmm. not tangible evidence. Well, that's that's what he has to say about Ishmael. See, it's not. I mean, this, you won't derive a lot of comfort from reading that. If you're in a trial, you won't turn over there and read the generations of Ishmael and derive a little. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't written for that purpose. Generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Notice how precise he is. These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham begat Isaac. So he, he spells it out for you. Very specific. Isaac wasn't adopted. He wasn't an adopted son. He was a born son. Now up to Jesus, the genealogy, flesh and blood genealogy, up to Jesus was everything. Of all the generations that were extant in the world, valid ones are traced back to the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Both Matthew and Luke underscore the importance of genealogy. Matthew takes the genealogy from Abraham to Christ. Luke takes it from Christ to Adam. We're talking flesh and blood genealogy now. Up until Jesus, flesh and blood genealogy was essential. Now something happened when Jesus was born. He was cut off out of the land of the living. And who shall declare his generation? He didn't have a generation, a flesh and blood generation. So it looks like everything terminated. <laughs> but then with Jesus, he creates a new people. Amen. He creates a new generation through Jesus Christ, a different kind of people, not a flesh and blood people, see? A new generation. So up until Jesus, flesh and blood, if you were a priest, you had to have the right genealogy. You had to go back to Levi. You had, you had to be of that order, see? So God's people are traced to progeny. You have to cut at some point. You have got to personally know you're connected with Jesus. Amen. You can't guess on this. There's enough evidence in Scripture to help you arrive at a at a conclusion. This is not a hopeless search. But that's what it's your connection with Jesus that moves God to accept you. Yes, it's not because you did A through Z. Even though you had to do A through Z. But that's not what God recognizes. The only man God really recognizes is Jesus Christ. The man Christ Jesus. Amen. That's the only man, but he accepts all his generation too. Yes, amen. Remember there in Hebrews 2.13, he depicts the Savior standing before the Lord and saying, Behold, I am the children which thou hast given me. That's his generation. So who shall declare his generation? We can declare his generation. And we can declare as Isaiah 54 that comes after Isaiah 53. He said, get the tent larger. Take up the tents, tent pegs and stretch out the tent. Because the children of the barren are going to be more than the children of the married. Jesus is going to have more children than a devil. Amen. They say, well, I don't, it looks to me like it's going to be a lot fewer. Oh, you, it's not over yet. Yeah. It's not over yet. The knowledge of the Lord's going to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea twice. God prophesied it. He prophesied it through Isaiah and through Haggai, and he means that this is going to happen. And the latter harvest is going to be bigger than the first fruits of Pentecost, and the first fruits of Pentecost is a whopper harvest compared to what's happening today. Yeah. But it's miniature compared to what's going to happen. Amen. God's not going to shut this thing down. He's going to demonstrate to angels and principalities and all doubters that God is greater than all and God can raise up a generation from rocks if he has to do it. Amen. Amen. Oh, I love, to, <laughs> I love to think about it. 
So Jesus does have a generation. It's a new creation. God's workmanship is called, Ephesians 2.10. And he tells you, they that are children of the flesh, these are not the children of God. He just comes right out and tells you, Romans 9.8. They that are children of the flesh are not the children of God. And in this, in this connection with Jesus, there's something that Paul alluded to that is quite challenging. It's found in 2 Corinthians 4, 10, and 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying, the dying of the Lord Jesus. Oh, I say always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So that both the death and the living of Christ are revealed in your mortal body by godliness and holiness and living unto the Lord. That's how you can confirm. We see... It's tragic to say this, but a lot of people don't know what holiness is. They, they have no idea what it means to be godly. Some people think well, it's the way you cut your hair, or it's the kind of socks you wear. There's a bit of different people with different ideas, but I, at some point this has got to become clear to you. The dying of Jesus, you're dying to the world. You're dying to the world. You're living unto God in, the, in this body. It's being made known. That's right. Amen. A lot of people hate that. Oh, I know it. That's where the old man's crucified. There's a part of you that's got to die, right, yeah. Brother Charlie? There's a part of you that's got to die. And the only, the only kind of death God recognizes is death by crucifixion. Yeah. Uh -huh. yes. You die, it's a slow and an agonizing death. Amen. So when you were baptized into Christ, Romans 6, 6 says, God crucified your old man for you. Your job, keep him. Yes, amen. Keep him crucified. Yeah. If you let him off the cross, you'll find he's just as potent as the day he's yeah. put up there. Amen. You're, You're participating in the fellowship of the suffering. That's right. Yeah. That's a, I say that, that's the generation of Christ. The generation of Christ follows the same path to glory uh -huh. he took. Amen. Follows the same path. Yeah. Now our text says that Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife. 40 years old. And a little later, well, that, that means she was, she was married to him maybe as young as 19 or 20 or 35 or 40. They were married a long time. They were married a long time. We don't know the length of Rebecca's life. We know Sarah lived to be 127. I don't know if that was like kind of a standard at that time or not. But if that's how long she lived, she was married about 90 years. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> as Isaac lived 180. So he identifies Rebecca. Right? Remember how precise he was in identifying Ishmael, Hagar, the Egyptian, bond maid of, uh, he says it's Rebecca, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, of Pat and Ram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian, he spells out. Just so you know, there wasn't anything in Rebecca herself that merited this. Anyone that wasn't Abraham, Abraham, he, was, he, he wasn't a Jew, he was a Syrian too. Just so you know that God makes his people what they are. Now, prior to Abraham being called by God, here's the I'm showing the point I'm showing here is in the Bible you know very little about people before they were used of God. Sometimes he'll he'll give you a little information, but most of the time not very much. So before before Abraham was called by God, we knew he was begotten by Terah. We know he dwelt in Ur of the Chaldees, and he was a Syrian ready to perish, as Moses said, Deuteronomy 26. He was in Mesopotamia. 
He came from my idolatrous background, Joshua says in Joshua 24, 2. The prophet Ezekiel alludes to the background of both Abraham and Sarah prior to Abraham's call, referring to Abraham as an Amorite. Prior to the beginning of Isaac, so far as procreation was concerned, Abraham was as good as dead. See, that's what we know about Abraham <laughs> for the first 70, 75 years. Hardly anything. Let me tell you, what you were before you came to Christ, it might sound real impressive to some people, but it doesn't really amount to a hill of beans. God's people shouldn't be talking about what they used to be. They should be talking about what they are Amen. in Christ Jesus. Of course, this will dry up a lot of ministries, but so, so be it. Now, following uh, the personal involvement in the person, Rebecca, I want to go with Sarah and Rebecca, excuse me. Sarah, what do we know about Sarah before she was in God's purpose? She was barren. It was characterized by deadness of womb. She's described by the prophet Ezekiel as a Hittite. That's, that's it. That's all we know about her. And what about after she is used of God? Well, she is said to have been barren. She is described as the mother of nations now. She received strength to conceive seed. She was delivered of a child and she was past age and she judged him faithful at promised. And the mother of those people who do well, and she's the mother of wives who do well and are not afraid of any amazement. So that's what you know about her after. Before Rebecca was called into the purpose of God, she was known as the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian, the sister of Laban. And our text is going to tell us she was barren. That's, that's all we know. But afterward, Bethuel and Laban pronounced a tremendous blessing on her. They said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those, of those that, which hate them. We also know she conceived by one, even Isaac. And we know that she was grieved by who Esau married. Yeah. He's grieved by, he picked out the wives he did. Now, there's still some godly mothers. When they, they were grieved by who the sons married. Mm hmm? He had fellowship with yeah. Rebecca there. But so what do you learn from all this? You learn that involvement with God changes people. Yeah, it changes who they are and what they do. <coughs> Abraham was enabled to beget children. Sarah received strength to conceive seed, as well as Rebecca. All of them changed their location. They all lived in Canaan and never left. Mm -hmm. Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and their wives never left Canaan. Yeah. They moved there and they stayed there, even though they didn't own any property there. They were living by the promise, see? Now, in Christ, this change is even more pronounced. It's more pronounced in Christ. Now, the involved person is born again. All right, that's... that's <laughs> That's bigger. Their nature has changed. New creation. They're transformed from enemies to reconciled. From darkness to light. The laws of God are written in their heart, put in their minds. They're freed from condemnation. They're washed from their sins. Their conscience is purged. They're delivered from the power of darkness. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Given the Holy Spirit who leads them. Jesus in, being in Jesus involves a new heart and a new spirit, as Ezekiel prophesied. It's as far superior than anyone prior to Christ ever experienced. They experienced changes, but not of that magnitude. Now, David said, created me a clean heart, but he never really got one. Not because God didn't want to give him one, because the sin, all sin, had to be taken away before even a single sin could be forgiven. Amen. It all had to be, in total. That's why God can do all this now. Jesus has done what nobody else could do. He has taken sin away in mass. He's destroyed the devil. He's plundered principalities and powers. See? He's defeated the last enemy, which is death. 
That's why we have such superior things now Amen. in Christ. In view of this, it's totally unacceptable for any professing Christian to live with less faith than Abraham had Amen. and Isaac and Rebekah. This is completely unacceptable. But you will find in the average American Christian will look at Abraham as a hero, led in idolatrous worship and offering to children a wicked, wicked king. And here's what uh, the Chronicles say about him. And when he was in affliction, <clears throat> he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed unto him, and he was entreated. He, God, was entreated of him and heard his supplication, and brought him again to Jerusalem and his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God, his prayer also, and how God was entreated of him and all his sins and his trespasses and the places which he built, high places and set up groves and graven images. Before he was humbled, behold, they are written in the sayings of the seers. Boy, we had to write that down. Maybe you know someone is really down off the deep end. Yeah, study about Manasseh. During the renewal of Ezra's time, it is written, so we fasted and besought the Lord for this, and he was entreated of us. God spoke of future conversion of Egypt in this manner. The Lord said, the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. This is Isaiah 19.22. This is what God said. He shall smite and heal it, and they shall return even to the Lord, and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. Now, I don't think that's taken place yet, <laughs> but it's still there. Mm -hmm. See, entreaty is not an ordinary prayer. It's a kind of an offering to the Lord like a burning of incense. It's an extended, powerful petition. And this is the first example of this kind of prayer in Scripture. It appears that Isaac was convinced of some things that God had revealed. Mm -hmm. Namely, that all the families of the earth would be blessed through Abraham's seed. Yes. He didn't know the where's and wherefores how this is all going to work out, but he must have believed this. And proceeded accordingly. He knew the land of Canaan was the rightful inheritance of the seed of Abraham, so he wanted to make sure he had some seed living in the land. In a very definite sense, the generations of Abraham would come through him. Yeah, right. So he knew this, so it's just not to have children. This is it puts a little different slant on it. Now the text, of course, is very pertinent because as James said, the fervent, effectual prayer of a righteous man avails much. Still does. Still does. Amen. Of course, if righteous men are rare, then this kind of prayer is rare. Uh -huh. But there's no need. See, there's no need for anyone not to be righteous. There's no need. Because God has made a way for men to be righteous. Yes. Righteousness of faith. If a person, a person will come to him through Christ, he'll, he'll make the person righteous. He'll make them righteous. Amen. By one, by one when many shall be made righteous. That's what, what the scripture says. So there's no... Uh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of... Go ahead. You would, you could, um, you'd see that the, the connection that um, Isaac... Now, he was the one that was tied up and put on the altar. Yes, right. and lived through that whole experience. Yeah. That his character would be altered, or that he would he would see things about God that no one else yeah. had seen to that date, because he had seen a unique thing. This was a, this wasn't just like a ten year old. This was a, a a man, and he lived through this and saw the goodness of the Lord and saw the the the, the provision that the Lord gave yeah. Abraham. And then no doubt, as you already said, they spoke about this, of the promise. Yeah. And so this was a, quite a dilemma. <coughs> they have to, no children, what am I going to do? Yeah. So, but, so he come to this conclusion. Yeah. Then this, he might have, it, yeah. he might have talked to this mother, you know, and she said, let me tell you, son, it's, I was barren too. Yeah. Yeah. After this, Rachel's going to be barren too. that we've been seeking to bring before the Lord in our Wednesday night studies, mm -hmm. in our prayer time, things to where a full case is made 
yeah. before the Lord yeah. on a particular yeah. need or mm -hmm. uh, intercessory need. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's also good to see that the individual is also <coughs> capable of such an entreaty. Well, amen. That there's, there's a unit and a body that can bring such a request to the Lord, making it full, but then the Lord gives the burden to individuals also that, yes. can, that can fill that with the ministry Amen. Amen. Also, I found in the uh, intercessory prayers of the Lord for That's us. That's right. That this is that kind of prayer that is. It's an entreaty. That's God, right. This um, incense going up to God. That's Amen. why we need Him to be able to do that because we don't know what to pray for. But, but. Amen. Yes, we do want to encourage people to learn how to pray extended mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. extended prayers yeah. where you produce your cause Job, you know, I said, well, I knew could find him. I would order my cause yeah, uh -huh. and bring forth my arguments. He'd yeah. present his case. That's right. And you have good reason to be optimistic because God is a good God. <laughs> He's a gracious God. So, well, the Lord was entreated of him. He granted his plea. I don't doubt that in this, Satan had thought to block the purpose of God but here's woman number two see God you, Satan works for God everybody understands this I hope he can't do anything unless he says captain may I yeah, that's right. he can't mm -hmm. so he God God let him mm -hmm. do some work and then he just just by the prayer of a man mm -hmm. overturned the council, but it's not by coincidence that barrenness and all kind of things looked like they were going to interrupt the coming of the Messiah, yeah. uh -huh. but they didn't. <clears throat> well, given, I, I suspect that maybe uh, they had a little meeting again, and in glory, where, where the, the evil spirits and Satan was present, and they, he allowed him to make. That's you know, right. You know, so I'll that be a lion spirit. Yeah, I'll be a barren spirit. I, right. <laughs> See, I want to, you've got to see it from God's viewpoint, brothers and sisters. You've got to see it from God's viewpoint. God works, He works, but first of all, He orders the circumstance to what looks like work is impossible. It looks like the thing can't be done. That's how God sets the stage. Right. See? <laughs> oh, praise God. Well, if the bad things happen to you, yeah. devil got permission to do it. There's a way out of it. The interesting thing to consider is that Isaac saw this, that you could entreat God. Yeah. Centuries before the scriptures were written. Now we, we read it, see we got a, a vast repository of knowledge from scriptures that we can appeal to that they didn't have. So this, it should be wrong for the people of God to think of God last of all. Yeah. Yeah. Like someone said, listen, we got to pray because the doctor gave us this assessment. The only thing that's going to help is prayer. And somebody said, oh no, has it come to that? But see, some people think this way. Not intentionally, it's just kind of the way Satan has orchestrated things. So this is how people think. It's a last, well, if that didn't work, let's, let's try prayer. Maybe that'll, maybe that'll work. Well, a fervent, fervent, effectual. Prayer of a righteous man avails much. I'm wrong about this. There are a lot of people are just praying. <laughs> I know what you're... Their faith is in prayer. It's not in the Lord. I know what you're mm -hmm. saying. They're not entreating the Lord. They're uh -huh. just praying. Some kind of an incantation. Mm -hmm. like yeah. Some magic well, words or something like that. Somewhere yeah. in this lesson I said that some people think that mentioning it is praying. Uh -huh. That they just mention it before the Lord. They, that's not praying. Mm -hmm. Mention it. Now he leaves forward. He says uh, the children struggle together within her. And she doesn't know his children at this point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the children struggle within her. And it was confusing to her. What's, what's happening? The variety of different views of what happened, but what she really meant. It's take, it says to struggle together. Some versions say they jostled each other. 
That's the NIV. The children were fighting together inside her. Basic Babylonians. The children fought with each other inside her. The children strove with each other. Well, the, the idea of fighting is, is there. It wasn't like it was bumped up accidentally against. The word struggle means to crush or oppress. So it's a militant term. The children of Ammon vexed and oppressed the children of Israel. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. See, here's these two infants. We don't know at what point this was. God's going to explain what's happening. One version says they tumbled and kicked. <laughs> now, when the, Rebecca didn't attempt to interpret this experience, yeah. she, she didn't know what it was. Why am I thus? Some versions say, if all's well, why, why, why am I like this? Why is this happening to me? If it is to be this way, why do I live? Is, is this the way you bring forth children? I mean, if it's going to be like this, why go on living? <laughs> and so forth. So what Rebecca was experiencing wasn't ordinary. That's why she couldn't interpret it. It wasn't, it, it, she had nothing to parallel it with. It wasn't ordinary at all. When a woman expected a child, this, is, this isn't what they suspect, expected to happen. She did not know that there were two children in her womb. This she didn't know. And that they were struggling. She didn't know that either. She's also at a decided disadvantage because of limited revelation. She does, there just hasn't been a lot said about this. It's the first record of any twins being born. It's in the Bible. So what does she do? Now that she knew to do this, is this is remarkable. So she went to inquire of the Lord. How about that? Put her question to the Lord. Take this up with the Lord. Get an explanation for this. Some conjecture that she inquired of the Lord by going to someone else and ask them. Like some th think she went to Melchizedek and asked him. Or maybe even for Isaac. But I take it just like the text says. She went to the Lord. Amen. She did know what to do. So her and Isaac must have been talking. Mm -hmm. yeah. She knew what to do. And the Lord said to her, which is again quite remarkable, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And that's the first indication Rebecca has that this is twins. Mm -hmm. However, the Lord doesn't say she has twins. <laughs> Such as two nations. <laughs> See, God views things from his perspective, not from a human perspective. Yes. The nations to which the Lord refers are Israel and the Edomites. Edomites come from Esau, Israel from Jacob. The Edomites bore the name of their progenitor Esau. Genesis 36, 1 says, Esau is Edom. Genesis 36, it's the same thing. Genesis 36, 9 says he's the father of the Edomites. So Edom was another name for Esau. The Israelites also bore the name of their progenitor, Israel. See, the, na the, the nation was named after the one that authored it. And that Jacob's name was changed to Israel, you know, when he wrestled with the angel. Although they were hostile to one another, like with Ishmael as in the case of Ishmael who was blessed because of Abraham God protected the Edomites it's amazing here's what he said to Israel after he'd given the law and command now the people saying ye are to pass through the coast of your brethren your brethren the children of Esau which dwell in Seir and they shall be afraid of you. Take ye good heed to yourselves, therefore meddle not with them. For I will not give you their land, no, not so much as a foot's breadth, because I have given Mount Seir unto Esau for a position. Why? Just because they had a remote connection with Abraham. <laughs> Very remote. That's how, 
So people think about God being fair. How about, how about that? What an example that is. And further counsel him, Deuteronomy 23, 7, Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. <laughs> He's like, we'd say half-brother, but this is how God... So God's people are to be an understanding people. Notwithstanding, Edom was hostile against Israel. So to Edom, he said later in Amos to Amos the prophet, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because he did pursue his brother, as Israel, with the sword, and did cast off all pity, and his anger did tear perpetually, and kept, he kept his wrath forever, but I will send a fire on Teman. Punished him. Told Israel, treat him kindly. They didn't reciprocate with kindness. Jacob and Esau, they were different people. Different kind of people. And God said to Rachel, the elder is going to serve the younger. The one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elders will serve the younger. Now, this is a revelation to Rebecca. She never did forget this. Yeah, that's right. Oh, man, this the people had drugged this thing about... Jacob deceiving Isaac. Of course, this wasn't cooked up by Jacob in the first place. Yeah. Rebecca's the one that mandated it, and she did it because she had this word from God, yeah. but she hadn't any other word. She didn't know how God was going to do this. Uh, yeah. Looked like, boy, we got to do something now. So that's, that's why Abraham and Sarah tried to have a child by proxy, because it wasn't because... They were being fleshly exactly. They did, they, God hadn't told Abraham that Sarah was going to have the son. He didn't tell her. He didn't tell Abraham until he was 99 years old. Till a year before Sarah was born, Abraham had no idea Sarah was going to be the mother of Isaac. So they were limited by what they didn't know. Same, same here. So you can make a case and argue against Rebecca, but see, God didn't. God never did find fault with Rebecca. She just didn't understand. Now this isn't the only time that this order had been reversed. That the normally the elder was got the inheritance and everything, but it, this happened elsewhere too. It happened with uh, Joseph's sons. Manasseh was given preeminence over his older brother Ephraim. Same thing happened there. It was set aside when Solomon was preferred over Adonijah, who was the oldest son of David. And again, there was a departure from the standard when a man named Hosa made his son Simri the chief, for though he was not the firstborn, yet his father made him chief. So this, several times in Scripture, this ordinary rule was set aside. This is something God can and, and does do, but only God can do this. Men can't set aside the standard. God can. God's people are, to, are not to trust in convention or in tradition, but in God. Now, Jacob and Esau struggled in the, in the womb are, are a type of the believer. They're two contrary natures they carry in their bodies. They're called the old man and the new man, the law of sin, and the law of the spirit of life. Same two contrary personalities and two contrary powers residing in their body. And they're competing. Now, brethren, a lot of believers are like Rachel. They know they feel something going on, some conflict, but they don't know what it is. They think, I must not be saved because otherwise how could I have thoughts like this? They don't know that Satan throws thoughts at you. That's what fiery darts are. They're thoughts. That's what they are. They're thoughts. And if he can get you to take the credit for them, you'll begin to question whether you're in or whether you're out. I think this perhaps is one of the biggest hindrances among professed believers is not understanding this principle right here. I can remember when I uh, it first came home to me what, 1970 I guess it was 
And I preached a lengthy series of sermons on it because I, I knew, boy, I knew if anyone else knows about this, they haven't been telling me. So I'm going to tell it. And I made this video series on the good news about it, inner conflict and its remedy. See, you've got two different heads of the race, Adam, Christ, and you've got the offspring of them both in you. In your fleshly constitution, you got Adam. In your spiritual renewed constitution, you got Christ. It's the same body. You've got born of flesh, you got a part of you that is. Came in when you come out of the womb, it came in with you there. Then there's a part of you that came in when you were born again. It's called the flesh and the spirit. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these two are contrary one to the other, so you cannot do the things you would. That's Galatians 5.17. That means the flesh can't really do what it wants to do because it's got this competing influence to the spirit. And your renewed person, it can't really do what it wants to do because it's got this weight hanging on it of the flesh he's got to deal with. See, but God's designed salvation to work in that kind of circumstance. Amen. That's the kind of condition you're in which you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You learn to subdue the elder. Got to make the elder that which is fleshly was first, Paul says, then afterward that which is spiritual. So you got to learn to subdue the and make it, put it under your feet. The inner man or the inward man or the new man, it's got to be the one that calls the shots. And in Christ it can be. See, it's a perfect, perfect parallel of this conflict of uh, Rachel was having inside of her. Contradicting natures, and they're locked in combat from right out of the get-go. Can't get along. Then Jacob and Esau are born when their days are fulfilled. See, he leaps over. I don't know when this kicking occurred or fighting, but he leaps over. So he just goes to the next peak. He just he doesn't deal with the day-to-day -day circumstances. When her days are fulfilled, she, they were twins. Lo and behold, they were twins. I don't know if she knew. I, from that discourse God gave her, I don't know if she knew they were twins or not. I, I don't know, but she did now. She knew they were twins. First one came out red all over like a hairy garment. <laughs> the other version says his whole body is like a hairy garment. Like a hairy mantle from head to foot like a robe of hair. One would think he's wearing a fur coat, the living Bible says. <laughs> Covered with red hair. See the name Esau means rough. He that acts or finishes the prematurely developed Albert Barnes said, I think he's onto something there. In other words, Esau looked like a more fully developed child than Jacob did. He, he, he must have just looked stronger and bigger and so forth. So he was named Esau and lo and behold, he comes out, Jacob's got hold of his heel hanging on to his heel. Someone said he was trying to climb over Esau to get out first. <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't know about that, but Jacob, now I have to be a little cautious here. But all my life I've heard Jacob was a, his word meant a deceiver and a trickster. So I said, you know, I'm, I'm going to just take some time now and see if this is true. I can't find, I couldn't find any lexicographer, any dictionary that would support that view. The word Jacob means supplanter. Remember you think supplant means deceive. No, I, supplant doesn't mean deceive. It could, it could be that. It means you overtake the other one or you take the place. Yeah. Supplant. You take the place of the other one. So Jacob, he was named because he was going to take the place of, of Esau.
The name East Jacob is identical with the Greek word James. And I can't find any, every, I think it was 300 some cases where the word, original word translated Jacob. It was 342, I think. And every single one of them is translated Jacob. None of them's ever translated deceiver or anything like that. And James is never translated that way. So some have erroneously viewed this whole attempt to bring an inheritance to Jacob as a kind of premature act to cause Jacob to obtain the inheritance. But there's no, this is not how God explained it. Even when the, even when the deception took place, this is not how God explained it. And it's not how we should either. If the reasoning of some is correct, that this, he was born last, but he vaulted to first, it would mean that God, who worked out the entire matter, worked contrary to, to his own convention. And it's, yeah. the birth order was incidental here. There's sometimes when birth order like drove the thing, like who was first, Ishmael or Isaac, all right, that, <laughs> that was a critical thing. But even then it was Isaac was the one. Now this parallels the spiritual situation. Adam was first, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus was second. But Jesus has the preeminence. So in your life, now this is something you've got to work out. Nobody can work this out for you. Jesus does have the preeminence. Now you've got to live with that in mind. You've got to defer to Christ. And when there's a natural inclination in another direction, you've got to subdue it. Amen. The natural man, he was first, spiritual man is second. The old man is first, the new man is second. You know, although these two men, the old man and the new man, are within us simultaneously, they are not identical twins. Yeah. Huh? They have differing dispositions. Now Isaac was 60 years old when these boys were born. He's 40 years old when he got married. That means for at least 19 years, Rebecca was barren. For at least 19 years. See the faith of Jacob and Rebecca? See the, they kept the faith, and the proper time came. She understood, when Rebecca understood what the Lord was doing, she mm -hmm. shaped her life around That's it. Right. Even in giving the name of That's Jacob, right. she knew that the older, that the elder was going to yeah. serve the younger, so she gave him a name that was suitable. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Well, the boys, uh, boys grew. Both of them did. They grew. Several uh, young men, as mentioned in Scripture, that grew. Isaac grew, Israel as a nation grew, infant Moses grew, Samson grew, Samuel grew, David grew, John the Baptist grew, Jesus grew. See that? <laughs> Don't you know Satan would have stopped this if he could have? Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. But he couldn't. Amen. And you've got to learn to apply that to your own mm -hmm. situation. The fact that you're growing in Christ proves the impotency of Satan. Esau was a cunning hunter, man of the field, skillful hunter. He's kind of like Nimrod. Remember, he was a mighty hunter. And to hunt, in this case, means to track down. In other words, they, by stealth, they outfox the animal, so to speak. Jacob, though, he's a plain man, drilling in tents. In other words, say a mild man drilling in tents, or a peaceful man, or Homely, homely meaning homebody man, even tempered man, staying in the camp, a quiet sort who like to stay home. Man simply living in a residence, settled down, became a shepherd. Now, what about Jake? What does that mean? He was a plain man. What? So I'm going to share with you what some people, these are scholars, who thought this thing out. Rosenmuller says he was of a mild and gentle manner. 
Noble says he's blameless as a shepherd. Luther says he was pious. Keller says he was righteous. John Gill, Puritan man, said an honest, plain-hearted man whose heart and tongue went together, a quiet man that gave no disturbance to others, a godly man, sincere, upright, and perfect, that had the truth of grace and holiness in him as well as the perfect righteousness of his Redeemer on him. Adam Clark says, a perfect or upright man dwelling in tents, subsisting by breeding and tending cattle, which was considered in those early times the most perfect employment. In his moral meaning, it certainly could not be applied to Jacob till after his name was changed. See, he took the point, took the view that he was a mm -hmm. deceiver. Albert Barnes said, Jacob is of a homely, peaceful, orderly turn, building in tents and gathering around him the means and appliances of a quiet social life. Well, I won't read all of these. It's just a couple of men said that it, that these words couldn't be applied to Esau, uh, to Jacob until after. Mm -hmm. But most all of them, the word plain, it does, one of the primary means is godly. Mm -hmm. So most of them would consider that what it means is he was a god of a godly temperament not like a wild man like Cain was and like Ishmael was. The peaceful man, not a sissy. He, we know he wasn't a sissy because I remember when he went out, he had to go out and get some venison. You remember when Rebecca said, take your bow and your arrow and go out. So he, was, <laughs> he knew how to handle a bow and arrow and go hunting and kill me. So he wasn't like a sissy, not what he was at all. So I see this takes a suggestion. He was a quiet and a peaceful man, probably a man like David that did a lot of meditating. There's a parallel here, of course, with the flesh and the spirit. And the old man, the new man. The new man is a is a peaceful. Doesn't like fighting. Or he's capable. He's capable of fighting if he has to, but this isn't his preference at all. He's gentle, prefers quietness. He can take the kingdom by violence now if he has to. <laughs> fight the good fight of faith, but he, he doesn't prefer to do this. Perhaps you fought some battles that had to be fought, but you just wish you didn't have to fight them. You, just, you didn't like, didn't find joy in this kind of activity. So I gather that's the kind of person that uh, Jacob was. So there you are, we're introduced to a conflict of natures that living at the same time in the same womb. <laughs> well, what God's doing, he's acquainting you. He's acquainting you with the nature of spiritual life. He's acquainting, acquainting you with it. So you'll not be stunned if you run into trouble. And you'll not be overly impressed if you don't have trouble. You won't be saying, why did this happen to me? You won't be saying it, not if you understand what God's doing. This is how God's working this out, because in this way, he gets the glory. All right, I think I'll end there. And if you have something you'd like to add tonight. Yeah, really given, I was thinking of the stark contrast, even at their birth. It was a stark yeah. contrast, yeah. and then later you find that, that it's it's not just their looks, it's their character. Yeah. There's a big contrast here, and then a little bit later when 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 it there comes an issue about the inheritance, now we got one that loves it and one that despises it. So yeah. it, it's all worked out, you know, it, and to come to a conclusion that's contrary to that, it just you know like some of these people said, well, it couldn't be that couldn't be applied until after. It's like what. That is a conclusion that they drew independent from the scriptures. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, you, you know I mean? Just as a standard rule of operation, if God didn't criticize a person in the scripture, yeah. you certainly shouldn't. Amen. Yeah. 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 Yes, sisters in Sydney. You um, mentioned that Jacob, he is capable of um, wrestling. I thought of when he wrestled the angel. Yes, yeah, right. <laughs> Not exactly a minor feat. <laughs> I heard, I heard a fellow say, it's "Funny," he said, "That angel couldn't win until he cheated." <laughs> well, the angel lit up. You know, you understand that. The,
um, the comment that you made about um, the increased sensitivity of, the, of, of these brethren as they as time went on, they had more sensitivity Godward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I can't help but think that Rebecca remembered yeah. the prayer of the of Abraham's servant whenever he came to look yeah, for a wife for Isaac. And so here's here's a time now that there's there's uncertainty. We don't mm -hmm. know what she didn't know what was happening. She yeah. didn't know what was going on. And so she remembered this time mm -hmm. when Abraham's servant prayed to the Lord. And so she she was able to take the opportunity and pray to the Lord. Amen. That, that's mm -hmm. how the people of God function. They Maybe they don't have an understanding in an area, but then the Lord raises up some brother or sister that may have some more understanding, and they pick up on that. So they're able yeah. to to negotiate their way through by, Amen. By, by picking up on these things. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Barb. This parallel of the, the new and the old man struggling within. I like I like to think about that. But extending that thought with the likeness of Rebecca and the twins is whenever the circumstances were made known to her or the twins were born, she gave preference to Jacob. Yes, she right. loved Jacob and she Amen. made provisions for him more than for Esau. So we see that likeness continuing yeah. of giving preference to the new man. Yeah, I get the picture. When she saw him come out second, she knew he's going to be the ruler. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're very grateful for the revelation you've given of these holy people of old. How they trusted in you. And Father, we take this as an exhortation. You've you still require faith, still require us to depend upon Thee, but now we've, you have much more to build on. And we're grateful for your kindness in enlarging on this subject and in revealing Jesus Christ, the great cornerstone and the great foundation, sure foundation. How grateful we are for this. We pray that we will be the kind of people that bring glory to you under these situations, even as those prayer saints did under less advantageous times. In Jesus' name, amen.